Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a, an interesting one, a challenging one on death, dying, and the future hope. And this particular lesson is lesson number 11 in that series for December 10 of 2022, entitled End Time Deceptions. What would that mean, end time deceptions? Well, it's time for us to dive in. Let's begin with a word of prayer. A kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the guidance that you've given us so bountifully from your word and for those who are willing to search and take the time to study marvelous uh, revelations. Help us now to realize what's going on in our world, on in our world and what, uh, what warnings we have been given May we understand them clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. In this lesson, we will look at a number of end time deceptions regarding death and its results. We will see how they are in direct contradiction to the truth in the Bible. Jim? From the Bible study guide, our contemporary world has become a melting pot of the supernatural and the mystical, helped on by Hollywood which has no problem making movies with religious and mystical themes in a hodgepodge of error and deception. The old lie, you shall surely, you surely, you, you surely will not die, of Genesis 3, chapter, or verse 4, from the New American Standard Bible, also has inspired some of the most read books and most watched movies of the past few decades, and many popular video games as well, Undeniably, we are exposed to the temp to, excuse me, exposed to and tempted by the enchanted ground of Satan, which can appear in myriad form and even, in some cases, can come hidden under the veneer of science. One of the most deceptive phenomena has been that what have been called, quote, near-death experience, NDEs where those who had died have come back to life with a story of an afterlife. Many people have seen these events as proof of an immortal soul. During this week, we will consider some of end-time deceptions, including mysticism, near-death experience, excuse me, reincarnation, necromancy, and ancestor worship, and others. These are dangerous subjects that we should be aware of, but without exposing themselves, excuse me, exposing ourselves to their influences. They from the Bible study guide for December 3rd. Thank you. Let us look at several of these deceptions one at a time. Let us start with mysticism. Charles? Our world has been flooded by the strong waves of mysticism. The word mysticism is a complex term that encapsulates a huge variety of ideas. From a religious perspective, the word implies the union of the individual with the divine or absolute in some kind of spiritual experience or trance. This characterizes the worship experience even of certain churches. The phenomena can vary in form and intensity, but the tendency always is to replace authority of the written word of God with one's own subjective experience. Mm -hmm. In any case, the Bible loses much of its doctrinal function and the Christian remains vulnerable to his or her own experience. This kind of subjective religion does not provide a safeguard against any deception, especially the end time ones. So, have you had experiences with mysticism? How is it practiced in our day? People do not, want, do not want to take time to carefully read scripture and analyze how important it is to follow the Bible's teachings. They prefer to claim that they believe in the person of Jesus Christ, arguing that Jesus would never do such a thing or teach such a thing as suggested in certain passages of the Bible. In some cases, what they are effectively saying is that they, their opinion of what Jesus would do or would not do is superior and more relevant to that of what God has said and recorded in Scripture. So, 
we all think we know more about it than God, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we only have to look back at the history of the Roman Catholic Church to realize that people who claim to believe in Jesus Christ have murdered literally millions of Protestant Christians. Matthew 7, 22, going all the way back to the New Testament, tells us that even some of the people who have cast out demons in Christ's name will have no part in his kingdom. Myra? From the writings of Ellen G. White, the position that it is of no consequence that men believe in one of Satan's most successful deceptions, he knows that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he, Satan, is constantly seeking a, to substitute false theories, fables, and other, uh, and other gospel. That's from The Great Controversy, page 520. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Prophets and Kings 177. I don't know how that makes you feel. Uh, it should scare us. We must not allow our human desires or emotions to cause us to do things or to believe things contrary to the Word of God. Have we ever been tempted to do such a thing? Mm. Next, let us consider near-death experiences. Sally? Some of the most popular modern arguments to prove the theory of a natural immortality of the soul are near-death experiences. In the book, Life After Life, The Investigation of Phenomenon, Survival of Bodily Death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. Mockingbird. Ah, I live on Mockingbird. <laughs> <laughs> um, Raymond, a. Raymond A. Moody, Jr., presents the results of this five-year study of more than 100 people who experienced clinical death and were revived. These individuals claim to have seen a loving and warm being of light before coming back to life. This has been regarded as exciting evidence of the survival of the human spirit beyond death. Back cover. And yeah, that's what's on the back cover of the book. Yeah. Over the years, many um, other similar books have been published promoting the same idea. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Right. There's a movie out right now on that oh, yeah. very t subject. I, I don't, I was looking there for it, but uh, people claim you know, they're getting converted because they saw this thing. And they, this guy, they at least, I think it's a novel uh, that uh, about near death experience. Yeah. I went to hell and saw that. And it's nothing that's, new. That's as new as Dante, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, know, you keep doing <laughs> Reinventing. There's hardly, few, very few new stories. It's in the interesting world, it? to notice that there are a number of resurrection stories in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. First Kings, Second Kings, Mark, Luke, and John are some examples. There, if you get our handouts, you can see the exact places. None, in, and this was Elijah, Elisha, Jesus, and so forth. None of these examples tell us anything about those who had died having any so-called near-death experiences. And so our Bible study guide goes on to say, all near-death experiences reported in modern literature are of people considered clinically dead. What does that mean? Their heart is stopped, basically. They stop breathing. But not really dead in contrast to Lazarus in the Bible who was dead for four days and his corpse was rotting. Yeah. Nobody like that has come back to life. Um, John eleven thirty nine, as you know, neither do they, do they claim that everyone who whose heart stops goes through this experience, or well, of course the only people they get to talk to are the ones who come back, right? The ones so who are resuscitated. I mean, if you have read this, uh, 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 we had a we have a close relative that just over this weekend, ninety three years old, had a cardiac arrest, but they resuscitated her, yeah. but. Sure, talking and everything is different now. Not ready to write a book? <laughs> Not ready to write a book, no. 
her script. <laughs> Neither Lazarus nor any of those raised from the dead in biblical times ever mentioned any afterlife experience, whether in paradise, in purgatory, or in hell. This is indeed an argument from silence, but it is full, it's in full agreement with the biblical teaching on the unconscious state of the dead from, it's from our Bible study guide for Monday. So how do you personally understand and explain these, these near-death experiences? We do not want to deny the fact that some people may have had those kinds of experiences. So what is the explanation, Jim? If we accept the biblical teaching of the unconsciousness of death from Job chapter 3, verses 11 to 3, 11 to 13 and Psalms 115, 17 and Psalms 146, 4 and Ecclesiastes 9, 10, then we are left with two main possibilities. Either it is a natural psychochemical hallucination under extreme conditions, or it can be a supernatural satanic deceptive experience, 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Satanic deception could indeed be the explanation, especially because in some cases, these people claim to have talked to their dead relatives, but it could also be a combination of both factors from the Bible study guide for December 5. Years ago, remember that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, I think yeah. it was about, uh, she did some writings about this thing, and also uh, oxygen deprivation mm -hmm. is, uh, and I remember in, with the uh, weightlessness in these training for uh, space, to, mm -hmm. space, these spaceship travels or what are they doing, has experienced sim similar situations. Yeah, there's... But you don't sell many books uh, up with that. A scientific, uh, I mean, a friend of mine, a personal friend of mine, uh, did a study, a review of this kind of stuff, and found out that people on drugs, people in, like you said, oxygen deprivation, so forth like this, had very similar experiences. So, we're not trying to deny the fact that reports of such near-death experiences might be real. I mean, yeah, they, they were probably clinically dead, they were resuscitated, and this is what went in their mind while, while they went through that experience. And what about the uh, preconditioning, you know, yeah. a life, yeah, oh, prior absolutely. life experience uh, and what they've been raised with or exposed to, and now in, with the diminished oxygen, yeah. they can... Uh, yeah, or and they, they feel themselves dying and they think, oh, you know, and... Well, maybe and, had something late at night that didn't digest well. Mm -hmm. I, I can have some of those. <laughs> I try not to. So these things are reported, quote, scientifically. Does that mean that the conclusions that the authors draw when reporting on the stories are proof of life after death? Uh, no. Think of all the evolutionary ideas that are supposedly supported by science. Next, let us look at reincarnation. Charles, you ought to be an expert on this. <laughs> That's right, sir. You're talking with the guru. But I, I just, it, this would be interesting to... Um, talk with ER doctors from coast to coast. There's more yeah. than 5,000. Um, I've never had one, one patient that we resuscitated ever said, yeah, I had that. One of the most dramatic one was, this was unwitnessed, so I, well, maybe we should not. We worked on this guy for more than half an hour, we got him back, you know, and he walked away from the hospital, by the way. Never had any thoughts that he went through this experience. Yeah. And, and never yeah. had. Yeah. Never had this experience. Well, as Charles knows very well, this is a major reincarnation, is a major teaching of the Hindu religion. Right. So tell us about Hindus it. Hindus believe that the eternal soul goes through a progression of consciousness or samsara in six classes of life aquatic, plants, reptiles, insects, birds, animals, and human beings, including the residents of heaven. Okay, so what are we looking at? This is, this is straight, this is the, this is, yeah, this is the, the cause of, I mean, the, the thinking of evolutionists. Yeah, exactly. Well, they had a way before the evolutionists did. Scripture passages such as Hebrews 9, 25 to 28, 1 Peter 3, 18, clearly state that we live once and then we die on the earth. In light of these passages, why do some Christians believe that some kind of reincarnation is possible? Myra, you want to read us from Hebrews 9? Yes, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. It says, everyone must die once and after that be judged by God. And in the same manner, Christ also offered 
was offered sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting for him. American Bible Society. Mm. My Good News Bible, yeah. yeah good news. Mm. Many of these false teachings are accepted to, for a specific reason. This is, now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Sally? Many people believe not in what they should believe, but in what they want to believe. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, that's the whole story. If a theory brings them a, a existential peace and comfort, that is enough to settle the discussion for them. But for those who take the Bible seriously, there is no way to accept the theory of reincarnation. First, this theory contradicts the biblical teaching of the mortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Second, it negates the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in the redemption work of Jesus Christ and replaces it with human works. Third, the theory contradicts the Bible teaching that one's eternal destiny is decided forever by the one's decisions in this life. Matthew 21, 1 to 14 and Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Fourth, this theory downplays the meaning and re re relevance of Christ's second coming, John 14, 1 to 3. And fifth, the theory proposes after death opportunities for someone still to be still to overcome his or her own life pitfalls which is unbiblical hebrews 9:27 yeah which Myra just read to us from that's from our bible study guide are these points clear in your mind do you still have questions next we will talk about necromancy as that's a word you use every day right yeah <laughs> and ancestor worship. The word necromancy derives from the Greek terms necros, dead, which means dead, and mantea, divination. Practiced since ancient times, necromancy is a form of summoning the alleged active spirits of the dead in order to obtain knowledge, often about future events. Ancestor worship, meanwhile, is the custom of venerating deceased ancestors because they are still considered family. And these spirits can, it is believed, influence the affairs of the living. These pagan practices can be very attractive to those who believe in an immortal soul and who also miss their deceased loved ones. And you can understand that from our Bible study guide for Wednesday. Well, King Saul had an experience that should warn us against all such beliefs. This is a fairly lengthy story, but it's hopefully a well-known story. Let's just review it. Jim? 1 Samuel 28. I'm sorry. Verses 3 to 25. Now Samuel had died, and all the Israelites had mourned for him and had buried him in his own city of Ramah. Saul had forced all the fortune tellers and mediums to leave Israel. The Philistine troops assembled and camped near the town of Shunem. Saul gathered the Israelites and ca camped at Mount Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was terrified, and so he asked the Lord what to do, but the Lord did not answer him at all, either by dreams or by the use of Urim and Thummim or by the prophets. Then Saul ordered his officials, find me a woman who is a medium, and I will go to and consult her. There is one in Endor, they, uh, they answered. So Saul disguised himself put on a different clothes, and after dark he went with two of his men to see the woman. Consult the spirits for me and tell me what is going to happen, he said to her. Call up the spirit of the man I name. The woman answered, Surely you know what King Saul has done. Now he forced the fortune teller and mediums to leave Israel. Why then are you trying to trap me and get me killed? Then Saul made a sacred vow. By the living God, Lord, I promise that you will not be punished for doing this, he told her. Whom shall I call up for you? The woman answered. Samuel, he answered. Samuel, he answered. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed and said to Saul, Why have you tricked me? You are King Saul. 
Don't be afraid, the king said to her. What you, do you see? I see a spirit coming up from the earth, he answered. Uh, by the way, that word spirit, in most of all, it's the, an Elohim coming up. Out mm -hmm, of the yeah. Ground, okay? One of the gods. Uh, and what does he look like? An old man coming up, and she answered, he is wearing a cloak. Then Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed to the ground in respect. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me? Why did you make me come back? Saul answered, I am in great trouble. The Philistines are at war with me, and God has abandoned me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either by prophets or by dreams. And so I have called you for you to tell me what I must do. Samuel said, Why do you call me when you, the Lord has abandoned you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you what he told you through me. He has taken the kingdom away from you and given it to, to David instead. You disobeyed the Lord's command and did not completely destroy the Amalekites and all they had. That is why the Lord is doing this to you. He will hand you over, excuse me, he will hand you and Israel over to the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons will join me, and the Lord will also hand the army of Israel over to the Philistines. At once Saul fell down and lay, stretch, lay stretched out on the ground, terrified by what Samuel had said. He was weak because he had not eaten anything at all and at day and night. All day and all night. And the woman went over to him and saw him that he was terrified, so she had said to him, Please, sir, I risked my life by doing what you asked. Please do, excuse me, now please do what I ask. Let me prepare some food for you. You must eat so that you will be strong and brave to travel. Saul refused and said he would do and not eat anything, but his officers also urged him to eat. He finally gave in got up from the ground and sat on a bed. The woman quickly killed a calf which she had been fattening. Then she took out, took some flour, prepared it, and baked some bread without yeast. She set the food before Saul and his officers, and they ate, and they left that same evening. That wasn't very a, very fast food, was it? No, it wasn't fast food. <laughs> but so, 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 I mean, just a sad, sad story. Here's the person that the Israelites thought would be the ideal king. And look where he's, you know, what if all of the Israelites had seen him at that point? What would they have thought? I mean, just so sad. So and this sad. is their first experience. With the king. They never had one yeah. before. Well, Leviticus 19, 31 and 20, verses 6 and 27, and Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, make it very clear that all spiritual mediums, sorcerers, and necromancers in the ancient Israelite theocracy, what is a theocracy? Study of God. Theo is God, God is the one who's ruling. But God really doesn't do a control. Yeah, no. It, but, but, but that's what they call it, a theocracy, but it was not a theocracy. God does not control. They were abominations of the Lord and should be put to death for, for, by stoning. Are you absolutely certain that it is impossible to contact the dead? Do you know anyone that has tried to do this? Would you be able to tell the devil to depart because you know about him? I, I know some people personally who have, just a few days after a, a relative had died, woken up in the morning or middle of the night, I don't know exactly what time it was, and this person approached them, quote, this person approached them. And it's pretty scary. Yeah. Charles, can you read us some of those passages? Yes, sir. What, what, what Moses wrote? Yeah. Yes, halt. Moses, liberty has taken the me. Do not go for advice to people who consult the spirit of the dead. If you do, you will be ritually unclean. I am the Lord your God. Good news Bible. Leviticus 26, to 26 and 27. If anyone goes for advice to people who consult the spirits of the dead, I will turn against him and will no longer consider him 
one of my people. Any man or woman who consults the spirits of the dead shall be stoned to death. Any person who does this is responsible for his own death. Let me, me let me just interrupt there. Why would God specifically say stone them to death? Well, who's he saying? I mean, God could have struck them dead. I mean, look what he did with Nadab and Abihu. Look what he did with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. God could have taken care of them. But in this case, he says, stone them to death. He's asking the people, people to, to kill these people. Why? To, uh, well, no, they're I, involved. They were vigilant. I mean, that, that, well, God is trying to tell the people, to show the people how serious this is. You know, and, and he wants, he, he asks them to participate in the death of these people because he wants them to see how he feels about this. Um, if you have to get involved in something like that, it's, it's a lot more, <laughs> yeah. right. it, it's, we'll it's, never hard, forget it's that. harder to forget. Right, no way, no way. Okay, go ahead. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 14. When you come into the land that the Lord, your God, is giving you, don't follow the disgusting practices of the nations that are there. Let me interrupt again. What? This is one of the reasons why God specifically asked them to either chase these people out completely or kill them. Do not worship their gods. Do not practice their religious practices and so forth. And here it is again. And Many. how quickly they fell. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Solomon himself. Huh? Yeah. Um, and don't sacrifice your children in the fires of your altars. And don't let your people practice divination or look in the omens of, or use spells or charms. And don't let them consult the spirits of the dead. The Lord your God hates people who do these disgusting things. And that is why he's driving those nations out of the land as you advance. Be completely faithful to the Lord. Then Moses said, mm -hmm. in the land you are about to occupy, people follow the advice of those who practice divination and look for omens. But Lord, your God does not allow you to do this. Goodness, Bible. Yeah. So remember, these are people who are related to the people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. These are the same group of people and all these, they, I don't know what it was about these people, but these people practiced almost every religious perversion that you could possibly imagine in that little tiny strip of land along the Mediterranean coast there. And God says, I just, I mean, he said to the children of Israel, he didn't just in so many words say this, but he said, basically, your religious experience is so weak, there's no way you can be living among these people and, and survive. And of course, he knew, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Notice carefully that the witch of Endor professed to bring Samuel up from the grave. That was obviously wrong, even in her own thinking. In her thinking, it was Samuel should have been who had been a faithful follower of God, he should have been in heaven, and then she should have called him down, not up from the grave. Just this t tiny point, but an interesting point. Another familiar passage dealing with this issue, issue is found in Isaiah 8, 19 through 20. But people will tell you to ask for messages from fortune tellers and mediums who chirp and mutter. They will say, after all, people should ask for messages from spirits and consult the dead on the behalf of the living. You are to answer them. Listen to what the Lord is teaching you. Don't listen to mediums. What they tell you cannot keep trouble away. That's from our Good News Bible. And then Isaiah 19, 2 and 3. The Lord says, I'm going to frustrate the plans of the Egyptians and destroy their morale. They will ask their idols to help them, and they will go and consult mediums and ask the spirits of the dead for advice. Good news, Bible. So there's another group that were practicing all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, the children of Israel had gone from one group of people who were doing that kind of stuff to people who were doing it even more so. I mean, 
Christians who are serious about their religion need to study their Bibles carefully and pray for direction from the Holy Spirit not to accept any of these false teachings. Another topic for this lesson is personations and other appearances. Sally? Similar to nec ne necromancy. Necromancy. <laughs> That's a new one. Or demonic pers uh, personations of the dead and other demonic appearances. The personations can be in the form of a deceased family member, friend, or anyone. Both of the physical appearance and the voice are very similar to those of the deceased. Oops. Uh, then Saul made a sacred oh, no. vow. No. No. no? Wrong one? Oh, yeah. All, All of these satanic deceptions will be used to deceive those who are not firmly grounded in God's word mm -hmm. from the adult set Bible study. Okay, okay. I got lost. Sorry, Sally. Yeah, where mm -hmm. am I here? Second Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. Do you oh, have that? Okay, there? I'll read it from there. Uh, well, no wonder even Satan can disguise himself to look like an angel of light. So it is no great thing in his, if his servants disguise themselves to look uh, like servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get exactly what their actions deserve. Good news, Bible. Okay, so very clearly the Bible tells us that Satan and his angels can impersonate individuals, dead relatives, friends, or whatever like that. And I can, uh, I mean, I cannot help but believe in light of what we, we read in Revelation and so forth, that we're going to see a lot more of this as we approach near the end. You know, well, Ephesians 6, 13 to 18, we are clearly warned about the forces that we are facing. It is not humans that are behind all of the, these evils. It is the devil and all of, all of his forces. And let's just look at that because that's a key passage here. So put on God's armor now. Then when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist the enemy's attacks. And after fighting to the end, you will, stay hold, you will still hold your ground. So stand ready with truth as a belt tight round your waist, with righteousness as your breastplate, and as your shoes the readiness to announce the good news of peace. At all times carry faith as a shield, for with it you will be able to put, all, put out all the burning arrows shot by the evil one, and accept salvation as a helmet, and the word of God as a sword which the Spirit gives you. Do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. For this reason, keep alert and never give up. Pray, pray always for God, God's help, for all God's people, I'm sorry. And pray also for me, that God will give me a message when I'm ready to speak, so that I may speak boldly and make known the gospel's secret. For the sake of this gospel, I am an ambassador, though now I'm in prison. Pray that I may be bold in speaking about the gospel as I should. Uh, and these are these, this book of Ephesus was written by Paul, just a few days or maybe weeks as he believed, and it was true, that he was about to be released from his prison in Rome the first time. So that's why he's saying that. Tychicus, our bear, oh, we don't need to read that. Um, Back to you. Okay, we are clearly warned about the forces that we are facing. It is not humans that are behind all these evils. It is the devil and all his forces. Ellen White warns, the apostles as personated by these lying spirits are made, in contra made to contradict what they wrote at the dictation of the Holy Spirit when on earth. So think about this. People are going to appear claiming to be apostles and they're going to directly contradict what they wrote in what they wrote in the Bible, and that's going to that's still going to happen in our day. As a crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. Jim, you want to pick up there? Uh, yes, uh, he that is Satan has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect, and the familiar look. The words, the tone are 
reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven, and without suspicion of any danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. From Ellen White, The Great Controversy, page 552. I want you to think about this for just a second. We believe that by beholding we become changed. There are evil angels in this room right now. They're observing everything we do, everything we say. They have been observed, they have been, we have, we have guardian angels, good angels following, we have evil angels following us also. After they have spent our entire lives following us, I mean, and you all know of people who, probably some of you have done this, my son is very good at this, he hears somebody talking, pretty soon he, could, he can just imitate their sound, their voice, and so forth. You, you've all experienced that kind of stuff. I mean, think what, think what the devils can do. I mean, if human beings can do that, think what they could do. I mean, sound like it, look like it. Okay. It's called deception. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Satan is cunning, excuse me, Satan is a cunning foe. It is not difficult for the evil angels to represent both saints and sinners who have died and make these representations visible to human eyes. This manifest, these manifestations will be more frequent and development of a more startling character will appear as we near the close of time. Ellen White, Review and Herald, April 1, 1875. And so other places. it's interesting to notice if you know the history what was happening about 1875, the 1860s and 1870s in terms of this kind of stuff, do you know? Uh, the Fox Sisters. The Fox Sisters, who yeah. claimed that they heard, first they heard knockings and then they saw things and all that kind of stuff. So this was a huge movement. It swept across the country as, you know, just about the time she's writing the, these, these words. So, and as we near the close of time, we're that much closer now. Go ahead. Many will be con confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives or friends and declaring the most dangerous her heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything, and that they who thus appear are the spirits of devils. Okay, now the question. Would you be able to tell your dead mother is to be Notice dead in quotes. Mother is depart, to depart and leave you? Would you be prepared to quote scripture in support of your demand? Okay, let's hold on a second. What did Jesus say to Satan when, when he appeared was talking through Peter? Get behind me. Get thee behind, Get me. Thee behind me, Satan. Satan. I mean, could we say that to someone who looks and sounds like a dead relative? Are you, are you even with their best uh, preparation, it would still be shaky yeah. up, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've often thought about if my father came back and told me that, you know, my, I was doing something wrong or that I should do something different, that I wouldn't be able to say, get behind me, you're the devil. I mean... We, we, we must get prepared, and I think we're going to see more of this in, 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 well, no, you know what happens in the media. There, yeah. You know, they can make all kinds of things happen in movies and so forth like that. Oh, there's people out there that can see Jesus' face in a loaf of bread, you know. And yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or a fried egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Side of the building. Yeah. <laughs> Piece of toast. But, I, you know, if somebody were to come back that you had yeah. true faith in, you know, if Graham Maxwell came back and yeah. stood here and said, what I taught was wrong, I'd mm. be You'd do a double. I, I will say I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a few things you didn't have nailed down there. <laughs> Seriously, I've learned a few of them. Yeah. Just before us. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, it's not. Is it mine? No, no, it's no. no. They, they, they Just thought. before us is the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Revelation 3.10. 
all whose faith is not firmly established upon the word of God will be deceived and overcome. Mm. How many? All. All whose faith is not firmly established upon the word of God will be deceived and overcome. Mm. Would you be prepared to quote a Bible verse under those circumstances? I'm or would it be enough just to say, get thee behind me? I think that would all I would be able to say. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That would be, wow, just... Yeah. But, you know, I, I really spending all these years in the Adventist educational system and memorizing hundreds and hundreds of Bible texts yeah. uh, do pay off. And yeah. I'm very thankful for that one thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. What's really bad, I think is bad, is when the Bible study guide quotes the words of the... Of, uh, Someone so-called who's... friends of Job as, as being something true. That is, that is really, and your wife was so <laughs> targeted that thing about 25 or more years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and you got... Well, quoting the, the man there in, in, in Job 4 verses, I think it's Eight, 16, 17, 18, somewhere in there. Apparition. Yeah. And he's quoting an apparition. One of these very things we're talking about appeared to him in the night, and he says, he told me these things, and this has to be true because... Whoa! No. <laughs> if you can, I maintain if you can learn the, how to read the book of Job and use that as a template to read the rest of the Bible, with, along with the words of Jesus. Well, uh, it should, uh, I mean, from it, the gospel. It was the first book, probably the first right. book written. Yeah. Yeah. It, should, it should have guided everybody after that. Yeah. Well, then, if, if you go through where it says, God this, God that, you know, all, all the friends of Job, none of them quote Yahweh. No. They were told it another God. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Even one of them would, would, would be Satan. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, he quoted that. I know. That apparition. Yeah. Yeah. But not one, not one of those four friends of Job actually, they, they were talking about yeah. God or gods because mm -hmm. remember in Deuteronomy 32, when God separated the nations, he did it according to the sons of God, mm -hmm. the Beni Elohim, but Israel, or the descendants of Jacob, was God's special portion. Yeah. Which is Israel. Well, okay. Imagine, though, losing a loved one and then believing that this same loved one appears to you mm. and expresses love to you and tells you how much they miss you and says things that, yes, only they would know and says that they are now in a better place. If a person is not absolutely grounded in what the Bible teaches about the state of the dead, think of how easily he or she could fall for this deception, especially because they, they want to believe it yeah. as well. From our Bible study guide for Thursday, December 8th. Okay, well, I jumped in there. Who's next? What? You want to continue? Charles? Okay. There exists a foundation which claims that it is creating technology that will allow us to contact the deceased via texts on cell phones, haha, -ha. video and conferencing, video <laughs> calling the dead PMPs, post-material uh, persons. Post-material yeah, persons, really wow. PMPs. <laughs> His website claims that when humans die, they simply pass on into another phase of forever, but retain their consciousness so this is all Hinduism, huh? Identify uh, and core aspects of their precious physical form. Previous. Previous physical form. But most important, the folks at the foundation claim to be developing in three phases technology that will allow communication between material and post-material. Wow. Things. What's can taking them so long? Can you imagine? That's, okay. That's bizarre. Holograms. The first phase will allow texting and typing up post-material family, friends, and experts in every field of ex expertise. You, I mean, considering what's going on with social media today, right. you could just see this would just, oh, yeah. I mean, the world would just swallow this stuff. Billions of dollars yeah. for some people. And the pay yeah. portal, the, yes. the, the cash that that thing will generate. Uh -huh. Phase two is supposed to be enable talking with your dead ones who are living dear ones. in the dear ones who are living another part forever 
And the third phase, it says, will open the way to hearing and seeing those who are experiencing the field of all possibilities from a different observation point. Especially wow. scary is how the test is if communicating dead are really who are claiming to be. For example, okay. the site says, bereaved uh, parent might ask the following question of a son or a daughter who has changed words, words. world. Did you have a dog named Snoopy when you were a child? Did you, did we give you a pocket knife for a 10th birthday? You know, this happens, have you ever, uh, I don't know, it happens now. If you go onto a site and they want some verification, they will come back and ask you, you know, is this one right? Is this one right? Is this one right? And it goes back into your personal things. It may not be interconnected. They may ask me about my daughter-in-law, where she grew up. I mean, things. Wow, wow, that, that's a little bit too snoopy. Uh, it, it's just weird. Yeah. Well, we have to be so this tells us it's going to be demonic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just think about it. I just, I just started realizing, hadn't thought about that so much of social media because I, I don't have time for social media. But right. the so, people, the world is just, I mean, gone bazookas yeah. for mm -hmm. this stuff. How interesting is it that in light of this warning from Ellen White? Spiritual beings sometimes appear to persons in the form of their deceased friends and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. And Patriarchs and Prophets. Wow. So, When okay. did she write Patriarchs and Prophets? Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets was written in 1890. Wow. Proverbs 4:23. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Okay? Philippians 4, That's 8. That's scary. Yeah. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. And Sally, I'm going to ask you to read that next one since you made a comment just now. <laughs> Thousands have a false con conception of God and his attributes. They are as verily serving a false god as were the servants of Baal. Hmm. Are we worshiping the true God as he is revealed in his word, in Christ, in nature? Or are we abandoning, uh, adoring some philosophical idol enshrined in his place? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Our world is becoming increasingly interested in spiritualistic experiences, seances, Ouija boards, movies, books, and tarot cards all take talk about spiritualistic deed ideas. I recently traveled with a friend. We had to pick up something at this other person's house. And, and we went to their house and was looking for what we were supposed to find in that house to take. And there was all these cards around. I'd never seen anything like that. This person is, is producing and selling tarot cards. Oh. And this is a person uh, who used to be a devoted Christian, mm. now selling tarot cards. Wow. Years ago, I heard a story, I don't know, it was in my teenage years, I heard about in India, people who would work for the, the church, and then they retired, and they went over, somebody went over and visited them, and here they had their little Buddhas or little, whatever, uh, Hindu gods there in their, so a yeah. lot of people, it's just a job to work for the church. Right. You're so, right, then days are coming when it's gonna change. Mysticism. Accounts of near-death experiences, belief in reincarnation, necromancy, ancestor worship, and spiritism all contribute to the normalization of such things in our society and to the confusion about the afterlife. But God takes 
anything that has to do with spiritism very seriously. And why? I mean, just stop and think about that for a moment. This is all based on the very first lie. You shall not surely. Direct, direct, basically these people are directly following the devil. Why do you think God takes it seriously? It, 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 it's, it's, end for, it's the end for them. In the entire Christian world. Yeah. And the Bible world. That con false concept of God is idolatry. Yeah. Or the, uh, was it uh, page 177 of, of uh, Patriarchs and Prophets? A great quotation. Mm -hmm. Prophets and Kings. Pro was it Prophet King? My mistake. You're yeah. right. Okay. And the Bible warns us in extremely strong language against such practices because they are deception of Satan from our Bible study guide. The book of Revelation repeatedly stresses the fact that in the final events of this world's history, God's faithful people will be in direct conflict with the devil and all of his forces. He is called Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer, that ancient serpent, the huge dragon, Satan and the devil. How's that for a collection of names? Mm. God warns us with very strong language against his behavior and teachings. Note especially Revelation 16, 13 to 14. And you know, many people think when they read Revelation 15, and the, there it says the, the, the seven last plagues have come, it looked like the angels are coming out from the, the throne of God and so forth and pouring out God's wrath. And they go, oh, well, God is the one who causes the seven last plagues. Well, this is one of the seven last plagues, and guess who causes it? Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Does that sound like something that's coming from God? They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. What, what are we talking about here? We're talking about devils directly uh, involved in um, these things. I mean, and it is, it's, it's just growing and growing and growing as, as, as the days get closer, I'm, I'm sure. But the things that are on TV now, and especially because it's Halloween season, yeah, <laughs> uh, the the crazy animals and the horror stuff that you see. It's yeah. it's it used to be just once in a while you would see that. It just seems like it's really magnified now. We have a a, a nice young couple, a Hispanic couple, lives across the street from us. Just moved in very recently have a new baby and so forth. And apparently they really are into the Halloween stuff. They have these decorations out in front of their house and they're set up so that any sound that goes off, a car driving around like this, this thing, and it talks. Yeah. It talks, it's a devil stick, it's about 12 feet tall with a big old, you know, uh, scythe, one of those old blades that's over like that, like, like this, and it's mixing all, and then it, this horrible laugh and so forth. So you can guess what we are entertained yeah. with. <laughs> well, using various M metaphors in the book of Ephesians, Paul warned us against the attacks of Satan, the church, God's faithful people are called the temple of God, Ephesians 2, the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, and finally, the army of God. Are we fit to be like that? Are we really up to that? A particularly important warning is found in Ephesians 4, 13 to 16. Jim? And so we shall all come together at the, to that oneness of our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God, we shall become mature people, re reaching to every height of to the very height to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children, carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people, who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by excuse me, instead. By speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together 
and the whole body is held together by every joint which, with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. The Good News Bible. Yeah, so that is what's supposed to be happening to the church, to God's faithful people. I guess we shouldn't identify a particular church, to God's faithful people at this time in history. So Ephesians 6 tells us that we must be prepared with the complete armor of God. We must be armed with the truth, with righteousness, and with the readiness to announce the good news of peace. With faith as a shield, with salvation as a helmet, and with the word of God as a sword which the Spirit gives each of us. Are we prepared to use the word of God as a sword? Well, that's what we're supposed to do. If, we, if a relative whose dead relative shows up it's time to use the sword of the Spirit, right? In Ephesians 6.10, Paul started out by saying that we must be armed with a very powerful weapon. The Greek word used in the, is the same word from which we get our word dynamite. So before he talks about those various weapons that were, you know, protections and so forth, he says you're supposed to use these things with the power of dynamite. As we have discussed on many occasions, the children of Israel in their history went to war many times. When they fought under the directions of God, they had astonishing success. However, when they went to war without God's direction, they had terrible disasters. What should, what should that teach us today? Let us never forget that the present times are life and death matter for Satan. If a group of people come together and stand powerfully for God's side, leading to the second coming, then it is curtains for him. Are we prepared to be a part of that group? Paul and John suggested something quite interesting. We are not expected to go out and fight the devil using our own power. We would fail. We are to st uh, stand firmly with the power of the Holy Spirit and allow God to do the fighting for us. Remember that the God has already won the victory in the great controversy. Do you understand where your weaknesses are? Are you willing to take up those issues with God in prayer? Do you know of someone else who's struggling with some of these issues that we have talked about? What is the best way to pray for them and to try to help them? This is a big issue, folks, and we need to take it on straight. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have just talked about some really, really serious and important things. Help us to realize what's going on in our world, to see it as it really is, and to face these things and be prepared when it attacks us personally, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.